There's a push to crack down on banking executives responsible for the collapse of their financial institutions. Iowa could ban the state's public universities from spending money on diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. And Illinois state lawmakers consider a proposal to let people who aren't United States citizens become police officers. We'll talk about that this morning with Scott County Democratic Party Chair Kay Pence and former Iowa State Representative David Millage, a Republican. Great to see you both. We will start in Illinois with House Bill 3751. This proposal would allow people who aren't U.S. citizens to become police officers in that state. Now, they do have to be in the country with legal authorization to work. Applicants have to meet all other requirements for the job, just not citizenship. Now, this would make DACA recipients eligible, for example. We know police departments across the country are having problems recruiting officers. How do you feel about this approach? This is being proposed by Democrats, Kay. I think it's a good idea. Uh, they've been having trouble finding and retaining police officers. And uh, they did a survey last year, and that was the number one issue, uh, hiring and then retaining police officers. Dave, what do you think? This is sort of a weird issue because it is immigration related, and then you talk about law enforcement. How do you feel about this idea? I'm a little ambivalent because, you know, DACA people are in the country under a problematic program that's constitutionality has not been finalized yet. And to, to make them peace officers, I think, is a real stretch. And so I would, although I suppose if, if because there's a shortage and if they have merit and the character necessary to be a police officer, maybe they should be. But I'm ambivalent because of the background. You certainly need to have a strong vetting process, that is for sure. Uh, Iowa State lawmakers are moving forward with legislation that would block public universities from hiring people to run programs that promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. This seems to be a direct challenge to the idea of DEI as a general rule. And this is a Republican proposal. Democrats clearly oppose this. And critics might see this idea as a form of bigotry. I guess, what do you think are the long-term ramifications of this educationally and politically? David. Well, I jump on board for this. I wish I would have done it back when I was in the legislature. I think that the, uh, the this DEI initiative is destructive to our country, destructive to our republic, and has no place spending taxpayer dollars on a woke agenda. I mean, diversity is is fine, but it no longer. I'm quoting. I'm quoting now. It, it's no longer um, describes the breadth of our differences. But it's a device to demand, flatter, and grant privileges to frequently, uh, purportedly opposed groups. And equity is even worse. Equity, you take out character, you take out... Um, Why do you see this, I guess, as destructive, David? I mean, because the woke agenda has become the Republican buzzword in this campaign cycle. Why is this destructive? DEI. Because you're, you're, you're ascribing qualities to, to somebody's identity independent of their character or their, their beliefs or their actions. It's just because you have a specific identity, you're ascribed characteristics that they want to ascribe to that particular group. I just think it's divisive. I think it's, I think it's, I, I do think it's destructive, destructive of society to pursue this kind of an agenda. If, if your identity of a particular group does not define who you are. Kate Pence, what do you think about the long-term ramifications on this educationally and potentially politically? I think it's a really foolish bill. It's like they're trying to legislate Iowa back to the 30s uh, when women were in the home and, uh, you know, just this, you know, recently the athletic department at the University of Iowa settled a $4.175 million lawsuit for discrimination. And this is the fourth discrimination lawsuit that they've settled in the last, you know, less than nine years. So that's an additional seven million that they've paid out. Uh, Iowa State University is looking at a pending lawsuit for uh, discrimination against women professors. Uh, they've looked at, um, the plaintiffs have looked at all departments across the board and they are finding that women are being paid less than men in, in almost every department. So there's a huge liability there. And then even at the State House, uh, not too long ago, there was a $2.2 million lawsuit for a Republican staffer who was fired and um, she won her lawsuit because of the good old boy club in the Republican legislature. 
Let's move on to our last she, topic she, here. She went to settle that. Well, let's get to our last topic here. Recent collapses or near collapses of big banks across the country have some politicians pointing the fingers at the executives who run them. We saw the failure of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. First Republic Bank is a third on its way to failing until the country's biggest banks came to its financial rescue. But here's a problem. Forbes reports the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank sold more than $3.5 million worth of stock before it collapsed. Our colleagues at the Hill report executives at First Republic sold stock worth almost $12 million before it crashed. Now, President Biden wants Congress to pass a law to give the FDIC more power to force executives to return their earnings and make it easier to ban them from working in this industry after this and make it easier to find them as well. I guess, how are these ideas? Does it go far enough? And what about criminal punishment here? Kay Pence? I think there should be criminal punishment. And one of the things that we learned with the bank bailout in 2008, uh, it cost a lot of homeowners, their homes, a lot of pension funds, a lot of people lost their jobs, but not a single one of the bank executives had any penalty at all. And in fact, most of them drew a bonus. And, and you know, one of the problems is with our money in politics. Uh, when President Trump rolled back the regulations of Dodd-Frank in, in 2018, that was toted as one of his success stories because it was bipartisan legislation. And when there's so much money in politics, it's pretty hard to have them crack down on the abuse. And David, there were tougher liquidity standards put in place after the last crisis. What do you think about getting tougher again on this, in these areas? Well, I think it's absolutely necessary. There's no reason these bankers should not be punished for the, the egregious conduct. Um, and a lot of this has to do with them, you know, in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, they were a, a, a capital of woke. They, they, just, they threw lavish parties celebrating the wokeness of the company, and, and um, that's one of the problems we have here. But no, those, those bankers, they should be punished. They, and the, you know, don't take it out on the poor shareholders. The shareholders are in the, they're in the, um, uh, the background. They're the ones who are putting the bill. When, when it's the bankers themselves who ought to be putting the bill. David Millage, Kay Pence, thank you both for the conversation, and both of you be safe. That brings us to our question of the week. What consequences do you think there should be for the banking executives responsible for the recent failures, if any? You can send your answer by email to for the record at whbf.com or respond to this post on Facebook at the local 4 News WHBF TV page or on my page.